Holy shit, I just came close to getting a big elk. <clears throat> I've been farting with this guy for three days trying to figure out where he's going. And I finally found these long grassy meadows in here. They just go forever. They link up with the great trail. <clears throat> I got him. Uh, came in. I don't know where I was, just up here. He came in right here. 20 yards, I was about, I don't know, a mile and a bit away, sprinting. <laughs> At least I found him, but holy cow, he's nervous. I had him bugle once, just using cow calls, two different ones. And he's screaming quite a bit, but he just knows something's up. And this is a very high pressured area. But the more you go, the more you learn, so. And your success is, I'd say, 98% of knowing your zone. Now I know the zone. I found all of his fresh rubs. I found a dead silent root in here. I'm not leaving without this elk. I'll get him. But now that his bugles led me to this zone, it's about all she wrote for him. It's a matter of time, so I'm gonna back out of here, I'll let him hang out. I'll show you the length of these things. Like, look at this. These are all natural meadows. Nobody's coming in here, it's just guys quad hunting everywhere. He's been going back and forth in here a lot. So I'm pretty confident that uh, he starts up tomorrow morning. I'll kill him in here on this, I'll kill him right in here on this, this straight run right here. I'm pretty certain. Man, is he call shy, holy cow. There's his brand new rub, one of them. All right, look at this trail for me to walk straight in on. So good. <clears throat> so I'm back from up north from my first hunt from up north. And uh, I'm gonna make, I've been, from what I witnessed, what I heard, what I've seen, I've been, it's kind of compelled me to make a video to hopefully help some hunters out there, all right? So that's what I'm gonna do here. It might be a little lengthy because I'm gonna share on this video my full, whatever you wanna call it, uh, my morning that I harvested my elk, what I did leading up to it, all right? And that's going to help somebody who hopefully is looking for some kind of tips. Now, um, another reason why I've been compelled to make this video is because I got stopped in a huge game check on the way home in British Columbia, and there's probably eight conservation officers there, handful of RCMP officers, and they, it was early. By the time I got there, it was only like, it wasn't even noon yet, and they had 62 different hunters heading south going home from their hunt and only four animals were checked. That's pretty bleak, right? And I can assure you it is not from lack of animals. That's definitely not why. How do I know? Because I scoured all those forests up there in those same areas for the past three years. A carpet bomb with trail cameras, I know what's there. Also, I have friends of mine who have ranches up there and they told me the exact numbers of elk alone that are wintering on their properties and it's substantial. So, what's going on? The number one reason, I can assure you the number one reason for people going home without anything, the number one reason is gonna be because you quit. That's the number one reason. You can't even argue that one. You quit, you go home with nothing. Quitters get nothing. That's number one. Number two, most common reason I believe from what I witness is people are doing the exact same thing with the same results, right? And the same results, the result is nothing. So, and check out the definition of insanity. <laughs> it's doing the exact same thing with the same results and never changing up. So anyway, I'm gonna address some points here today to hopefully help some of you. Now the common 
complaint was it's too windy, it's windy as hell, it's hot as hell, it's windy as hot, it's, it's horrible, nobody's seen nothing, nobody's getting anything. I was getting texts nonstop from a group of people, friends of mine, who were hunting not too far away from me, but far enough <laughs> I could keep my little zone secret enough. And um, they kept on saying it's too hot, it's too windy, we're not seeing anything, it sucks, everybody's going home. All right. So this is what happens with Elk in British Columbia. The majority of it's too hot. It gets real hot real early. They're not going to say much. They're not going to bugle much, right? But they're still rutting. They can't not rut. It's the time of daylight that triggers it, okay? Not the temperature. Obviously, a little bit of frost definitely kicks things in. Helps, to, helps animals stay out longer and seem to move a little more. But once you get inside that timber, especially where there's spruce, it's way cooler. The temperatures are way cooler than when you get out in the sunshine where you get way too, you get heated up like instantly. There's the party still going on in the deep dark timber. And the deep dark timber is unfortunately where not too many people seem to go anymore. Why? I don't know. So what do you do to combat that heat and the lack of calling? Everybody says, well, they're active at night. They're doing their thing at night, right? So this is what I do. I get up and I get into my spot, I try to get up in a good vantage point on the mountain or the highest point I can or where it's a little more open where I have my, my ear view covers a lot more timber in the dark. And I got up during my last time at 4 o'clock in the morning, I grab, make two coffees, I eat a couple bars and I go and I race over to where my spot was, one of my spots, I get in there in the pitch black shut down the quad and then sit there with my first coffee and listen and just listen and listen and listen and listen wow first time trying the gopro on my head <clears throat> that's the part where i uh start at the bottom and listen for a bit for this guy I might let out a bugle to see if I can knee jerk him in to let me know where he is on the mountain. And the difference, the, the amount of game that you hear at that time is substantial. I'm hearing moose grunting frickin' all over the shop and moose are grunting everywhere. And then uh, I'm not hearing any elk. So I wait about 15 minutes after shedding the quad off, dead silence, now that's happen happening. And then I'd get my bugle and I would let out a ripper, ripper bugle in the direction of the timber where I feel I know where there's some elk and hopefully knee jerk a bull if you can hear me in the bugle. That's him or not. Darn it. That's him up there. There's two. All right, here we go. Now I gotta go up the mountain, around the corner, and see if I can't cut them off. Again. And that's what I do. I finally get one of bugle. And then uh, try to guess where it was, figure out always, I would always figure out what time the wind's changing. The wind's gonna change twice a day. Cool down, warm up, right, with the temperature of the day. Always, always, always take a note of the temperature always not sorry always take a note of the direction of the wind and I'm non-stop waiting for those thermals to kick in and change and I'm gonna take note of what time it changes right that's a very very vital point for me because eventually one day I'm gonna be on a stock on that same spot hopefully and I want to know how much time I have left for that wind to be going in X direction that's very important it's the first thing I'm doing always <clears throat> now what am I gonna do next all right so one morning I did get a bull, I got a bull to knee jerk 
bugle, and he was only about probably 400 yards away. So, and he was in a tangle, thick, disgusting tangle of brush. I'm in the same area up in the Peace Country where a lot of guys are, where it's absolutely thicker than shit, young poplar. You can't see more than 20 yards. If you try, if you try walking in that shit, you sound like you're on potato chips in a, in a uh, dead silent room, right? It's frustrating. I know. So what am I doing? I'm listening to him, seeing which direction he's possibly going, and I'm trying to figure out if I can get up ahead of him and get in there and hopefully cut him off. And another thing that I'm always doing is I am not trying to push it with the bugles. I use that one call to locate him. I got him. Hopefully he's going to keep bugling on his own. Maybe will, maybe won't. But either way, now I know what time the wind's changing. I know which way the wind's going, and I'm going to sneak in there and hopefully, using the wind, try to get absolutely as close as I can to him before I do any calling. And I'm going to hope that he calls before I call. I'm hoping that he's going to be calling on his own. I don't want to call. I don't want him to know where I am. I don't want him to be, feel threatened by me. So, if he's not going to call, well, I'm still going to go in there as quiet as possible. It's tough. And once I feel I'm real close to him, then I'm going to start with a cow call. But as I'm walking, I'm always making the odd cow call. Always. Because my feet are making noise. And any ungulates, whether it be moose or elk, I want them to think that I'm another ungulate as I'm crunching through that crap. Because it's so dry. Because it's so hot out. Right? You keep going anyways. So, get in there. And then, I'm still hearing nothing. Now we're talking hours later. Then I'll, I'll, I'll just call throwing the dice. I'm just going to take a gamble. I'm going to rip the bugle one more time and see if he, I can need your him into answering me. Sure enough, this particular bull answered again, and he's even farther away. He's moving away again. This bull did this to me four or five days in a row. He just didn't want to fight, but he couldn't stop himself from bugling. So he's going, he's doing an arc. What I figured out with this one particular bull, he's doing an arc. He's staying in the thick jungle and he's doing a slight arc like this from the bottom of the mountain to the top and all the way down to the bottom again during the night. And he would either be at the bottom or the top in the morning in the dark. And that would obviously be two different game plans. And twice I did this plan and I managed to get ahead of him and I got it tight enough and I managed to get 20 yards away from him one morning and I couldn't get the shot. He just wouldn't come that extra 10 feet and I was in an absolute jungle and then two days later in the evening at last light I got 30, 30 yards from him. I could hear his antlers banging off everything. It wouldn't give me a shot and uh, it just wouldn't happen. But in the meantime, the mistakes I was watching other hunters doing was almost cringeworthy. Now listen to this point. <clears throat> um, in the spring, in the fall, I was up in this near particular area of deer hunting and I came across I'm on my quad, I'm in the bottom of the valley, there's a logged off area in the bottom, and it is probably a quarter mile long. And uh, I bust into the open where I could see out in this open area, and 800 yards away from the sound of my quad was a bachelor group of six or eight bull elk, and they were full on panic running. 800 yards away from the sound of my quad during a time of year when elk aren't hunted. It's probably a month after the elk season shut down, but just to give all you road warriors an idea of exactly how sensitive these animals are to your motor vehicle, that's 800 yards away from me. They were already stampeding before I was in visual of them. They were stampeding just from the sound of my quad at 800 yards. Now think about that one, and for a lot of you out there, think about how you're hunting tactics are when you're using your, your motorized vehicle. All right, think about that one. 800 meters, running already. And while I was calling this particular bull, as a note, I am in the evening, it's last light, I'm sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm guessing he's at the bottom of the mountain again, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put him to bed. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out if he's down at the bottom or not before I go to bed, and so I know where to start off in the morning. And I've been sitting there for about 20 minutes, and all of a sudden you can hear, clearly hear a side-by-side -side coming on the cut line below me. These guys are only about 300 yards from me, 
And I hear this, and they're driving around in the, within the last half hour of seeing light. <laughs> put, 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 put. They shut it off. Probably 10 seconds after they shut it off, brrr, they let out this call. And they wait about seven more seconds. They flash up the side by side and keep driving. So it, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out why they are going to go home empty handed. And that's frustrating for me to know that somebody's going to go home with nothing while they're hunting. There's, this just sucks for me to, to know that and watch that. It bothers me. But it is what it is. But they just don't get it. And I wonder, it makes me wonder how many people out there are doing the same thing and they just don't get it. Especially at last light. When you guys are going to go sit somewhere for last light and you're using a motorized vehicle to get in there, you better get in there at least two, two and a half hours before dark so that that area can cool off from the sound of your motorized vehicle once you get in there and shut it off. And when I'm going in the morning, four in the morning, I'm shutting it off. I'm waiting at least 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour before I let out a call. You got to let the place cool down. You don't want to train the game that you're hunting that your call is directly associated with that motorized vehicle. Why would you do that? So anyway, another common mistake that a lot of people are making is staying dead silent and not moving while calling game, while calling moose or calling elk. We'll talk about those two species, all right? That's a very serious mistake. Every bull moose, bull elk, any elk and moose, when they walk, they make frickin' noise. You can hear them a long ways away. Now picture it, you're sitting there dead frozen silent, not moving in your calling. And you're calling and you're calling and you're calling and they're potentially maybe coming in and you're not making a sound. Well, there's nothing that gives it away more to tell me if I'm an ungulate that you're probably something other than what I think you are because this isn't normal. It's like a ghost is in the woods making kind of elk sounds or kind of moose sounds, right? You have to crunch and crack sticks too. So when people say it's too hot and too crunchy, well, who gives a shit? It's hot and crunchy for the game too, and they have to walk, right? They know the sounds. Just don't go wearing loud pants and swishing your feet and, and making yourself sound like a blatant two-legged animal. Just tiptoe through that thick shit. And I'm gonna show you how I did it in a video in, later on in this video. But that's a major mistake, is staying dead silent, not moving while those animals are coming into you, potentially, or you're going to them. You have to make noise to help sucker them in. You have to be noisy and crunch when it's hot and dry out. You have to. If you want to successfully sucker them in, you got to sound like them, right? So quit doing that, okay? Now, um, this particular bull I'm going to show you, by fluke, I've never done it before in my life, but I had this new GoPro, and I thought, hmm, I'm by myself. I'm like, well, I'm going to put the GoPro on my head and see if this will work out. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get this out. So what I did was I'll give you the quick rendition of what I did and then I'm going to let the video rip and you can watch it and there you go. And you'll be able to see how fast I move, when I moved, how fast I moved, when I called, what did I do after I called, the noise that I'm making, the thick shit I'm going in and um, you'll be able to possibly compare it to what you do and um, hopefully get better and cut that tag, right? Because we need you. I need you to cut those tags. I need you to be successful. I need you to go home with a success story. I need you to go to work to all your coworkers with a success story because we need more hunters and more conservation money. That's what we need, okay? So we really need all of you to get better, all right? So it's my particular bull. Um, I got too close to him twice and I was starting to get worried that he's going to know me by my call by now, but I had three different calls. I had two different cow calls and I had a bugle hanging on my neck and I'd mix it up. One evening I didn't use the bugle at all, I just used cow calls and even then he wouldn't come to me. Got him at 20 yards, I mean he was, he was a giver, but he's just too shy and there's a lot of hunters around there too, right? So anyways, one particular morning I started off at the bottom, I heard his bugle way off in the distance, I can't even guess thousand yards far up the hill halfway up but on a 45 angle so that means he was way back in the thick timber I'm like oh shit well I wonder if he's doing his arc to the top so I flash up my quad I rip up this side which is I had to go a whole full half a mile away and rip all the way around and circle around to get to the top shut it off I hike up the last three or four hundred yards to the top on foot and then I sit there on an old log and I listen right by the main trail where I had him a couple days earlier, nothing. I'm like, oh shit, 
So I waited 15, 20 minutes, blew the, blew the call, nothing. Oh, damn. And I need to go home. I'm tired. I've been getting up at 4 in the morning, sleeping on the ground for a week straight now. So what do I do now? I don't want to go in there from the top. I can't risk it. Um, it's almost getting a thermal wind change time. And I can't blow this one bull out of here. I just can't. So I jump my quad. I go all the way back down to the bottom. The sun's basically starting to peak up now, which is late. And it's getting hot. And the wind's starting to pick up. And I decided to go straight into that jungle and start walking dead straight. Change of plan. And I go back down the mountain, circle around below them. And then I'm gonna have to power hike through the jungle in there. I don't know. Probably a thousand yards anyway and uh, try to come in on that jungle a different direction, a new direction. I don't know the trails in there yet, but I guess I will shortly. Straight towards where I last heard that call, and I'm not gonna make a call until I feel I might be getting near to that spot where I think he was. So I got in the thick timber, luck would have it. There's an old, old cut line in there, growing right up with grass up to my shoulders, so I'm soaking wet in the first 20 minutes, oh well, and I'm, and I'm scooting along. And all of a sudden, he lets one rip on his own. Thank you. Wins my face, kind of quartering away a little bit. And now I am basically going fast, but not too fast, but fast, because I know I can, because that bull's quite a ways away from me. So as the video goes, you'll see, I'll just let it rip. You can watch, I think it's 16 minutes. I'm like fast pace moving compared to a, your typical still hunting where you go two steps and stand forever. And then I'm slowing right down and then I, I, I blow my call and I get a reply. And of course he's slowly moving away. That knee jerks me into going fast again. And then I slow right down, I stop and I wait to see if maybe something's gonna step out. Take my time, slow right down to still hunting mode. No calls, get frustrated, I need to know where he is. Blow the call, there he is at the, at the height of land, but I'm a little closer. And I can still tell he's slowly moving away. So I kick it into high gear again, dash another 200 yards, maybe a 250, stop, listen. And thankfully, it's getting a little more open, believe it or not, where I, I actually tagged this elk is it was probably the most open bush I'd ever been in with him. Everything was, else was 20 yard visibility. And then um, he let another bugle, and finally, I got my eye on him, and I didn't waste two seconds, I dumped him. So I'll show you exactly what I did so you know how fast you can move, how far away the call is, how often I'm calling, why I'm calling, and when I slow down, what I'm looking for. You can see it all. You can tell the, the tail of the tape on the GoPro itself. Okay, you guys? So getting back to the mistakes being made, number one is giving up. You don't quit. You keep it in your mind that you are going to get one. Every single day that I'm hunting, I know I'm going to get an elk or a moose or a deer, whatever I'm hunting, in my mind, it doesn't matter, and this is straight up honest, in my mind, I am getting an elk on my elk hunt. There's no way I'm not, it's just a matter of when. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how much game I have seen, I only physically saw him, a cow, another cow, smaller bull, that's it. That's all I physically saw, right? It was tough hunting, but I didn't quit. And another thing too is a big mistake is quadding right into your spot. Quadding at first light or quadding at fast at last light. Big mistake. That's absolute suicide. If you want to cut your tag, you just dummied yourself. If you're going to use your side by side or your quad to get into your spot, you better get in there in the morning at least an hour before seeing light. In the evening at least two hours before last seeing light. Okay, as a rule. Now don't forget what I shared with you. 800 yards away, a bachelor group of bull elk were stampeding already from just the sound of my quad 800 yards. Okay, you guys? Think about that one. And think about that when you're hunting. Especially you guys that, that quad around during the last half hour of light. I mean, let's face it, every blind squirrel's gonna find a nut now and then, right? But you wanna make sure you go home, especially with the cost of fuel and time away from work these days. You need to go home with that meat, right? So, big mistake is quadding into your spot <laughs> at first light 
and quadding around. Quadding around, period, it just doesn't do shit. It ruins it, okay? You need to pre-scout, figure out your spot, figure out the wind, figure out the trails, figure out where the game probably is, quad shy of there by at least 400 yards, shut the damn thing off and leave it alone. And get on, get off your ass and walk. And then, uh, same as last light, quit quadding around. <clears throat> quit quadding around. You use your quad, you get within 400 yards of your spot two hours before last light and you get off and shut it off and you silently slip in there and you sit. Okay? Timber is too hot, you get into the jungle. Get in the timber, walk those elk trails and cow call as you're walking. Get in there and go hunting. You'll get them. All right? So there you go. Hopefully what I just shared helps. I hope. And now I'll cut over to uh, the actual morning of what I did. I started at the bottom, went to the top, nothing. Went all the way back down to the bottom, decided I was going to the jungle, and I started going after them, and this is what happened. Now, good luck. Change up what you're doing and don't quit. All right? Need you to cut those tags.
Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> it's a good day. Not a monster, but I got the meat. It's a good day. <laughs> Whew. Well, that was good. <laughs> there were only, only two bulls in the mountain, a young one and a big one. And that's, I should have been home days ago, but oh uh, yeah. I had to get a bull. I got him. I don't know how I'm going to get him out here. It's going to be nasty, but I'll get him out. How freaking cool is that? I got it all on the GoPro. It's almost a six point. It's a five point. That's a nice bull. That was a nice pile of meat. Yes.